it's much more important for me to introduce her and to show that she has such a solid background uh, from New South Wales University graduating with honours some years ago and going on to do her neurology practice within the system here at uh, St Vincent's and the Royal North Shore before heading over, as often is the case, overseas, Britain, America, Europe, in Dr Chang's case, it's been to America where she had fellowships to the Mayo Clinic, which is very highly regarded, and even more so to Mount Sinai, where she had a research fellowship in the Estonia, uh, for Estonia Fellowship. We've been very happy to support her research here in the pathophysiology of uh, Estonia, and to get that research award from the Brain Foundation, Dr. Chang had to compete nationally, so you can be very sure that our selection committee doesn't hand them out unless it's very, very best of the best. And that makes it very tough for people competing for funds from the Brain Foundation because we're an independent research funder, the biggest in Australia. But it means that to gain an award is very prestigious. And I'm very, very pleased to be able to have this opportunity to introduce Dr. Chang tonight. Thank you very much, Florence. Thank you very much, Gerald, for that kind introduction. So I just want to um, thank the Brain Foundation for their kind award and also for this opportunity to give this presentation about dystonia. Uh, so I'll just open up my presentation now. So uh, as Gerald said, I'm one of the neurologists at the Movement Disorder Unit currently at Westmead Hospital. And hopefully with this presentation, I'll give you a general overview um, for dystonia. Yeah. And um, I'll list out the various types of treatment and its effectiveness, but the figures on these slides are only an average. And so there's quite a broad range uh, over how people respond to the various treatments. Um, of course, these, uh, this presentation cannot replace a neurological consultation, uh, so I still advise if you're worried that you might have dystonia, you should go and see a neurologist for a proper consultation. Uh, and hopefully it will raise some public awareness for this condition. So um, dystonia was initially described by a prominent neurologist in Germany called Oppenheim who described um, four unrelated Jewish children having uh, a childhood torsion dystonia back in 1911. And these children all had uh, sustained or intermittent muscle contractions which led to abnormal and often repetitive movements, postures or both. And to the right is, uh, you can see a picture of um, this description by Oppenheim. However, focal dystonia, which is dystonia affecting only one part of the body, um, has not really been recognized as a condition until the 1980s. Prior to that, it was thought of um, as a stress-induced condition, partly because of um, its rarity and also um, its uh, re reaction and response, positive response to things such as a sensory trick, which I'll talk about uh, later. Uh, it's not until in the 1980s where there was consistent abnormal findings during the recording of muscle electrical potential studies that neurologists started to think of this uh, as a brain condition. And um, they also noticed on these studies there was, again, persistent and intermittent muscle co contraction um, between the muscles that uh, doesn't usually uh, act together at the same time. So with the current definition of dystonia, which um, people have noticed that it tends to get worse when somebody's trying to perform an action, and at the same time the muscles surrounding um, the, those muscles that are supposed to perform the action actually activates when they're not supposed to. And many years later on, then people can develop abnormal postures, which becomes fixed because of development of contractures. 
So, how common is dystonia? Um, well, we don't know it so far in Australia because we don't have the research numbers uh, to be sure. But it's the third most common movement disorder throughout the world. And based on the North uh, American and European data, um, the dystonia that only affects one body part is as common as one in 3,000 to one in 8,000 people whereas the dystonia that affects the whole body, or generalized dystonia, uh, affects 1 in 28,000 people according to an American study. But the Austrian population study was quite surprising uh, for people above the age of 50. And in their study group, they found um, people 1 to 1.8% 1 of people actually had dystonia. And recently, it's been a change in the doctor's way of classifying dystonia. We mainly look at two main sections. Number one is what we see in the patient, for example, the age or onset, uh, its body distribution, and how dystonia can evolve over time, as well as our neurological exam findings. Uh, and secondly, we try to look for the underlying cause, uh, which is what we mean by etiology and we're looking for any underlying brain or spinal cord problem and also if it's a possible genetic condition by looking through if uh, there's any positive family history and a pattern of inheritance. And that way we'll be able to try narrow down um, the likely cause of dystonia throughout this extensive list. And so, so far, um, through scientists and doctors' um, study of dystonia, what do we know about it? So there's various ways of studying um, dystonia, either um, with human studies or animal studies. And the various ways are, for example, measuring electrical potentials and currents within the brain, um, for example, using um, brain magnetic stimulation uh, measures. And other measures are um, looking at um, functional imaging, for example, functional MRI it measures the changes in the blood flow within the brain, which is thought to be directly reflecting the brain cell activity. And during the brain MRI, we ask people to perform certain tasks, uh, for example, that triggers dystonia, to see what's going on in the brain. And thirdly, uh, there are also ways of measuring the brain chemical levels in the fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, uh, also known as cerebral spinal fluid, and also by doing um, special brain scans that analyzes the chemicals uh, within the brain. Uh, so the fourth method is looking at the brain uh, under the microscope, either in animal models of dystonia or through um, autopsy or post-mortem um, analysis of the brain through the brain donor um, um, program. So um, just going through what we know so far through um, measuring electric currents and potentials within the brain. So in people with dystonia, so far we've found there are increased excitability, not only within the brain, but also in the spinal cord and the brain stem as well. And there's uh, abnormal brain plasticity. And what we mean by this is um, there is increase of electrical potential during brain cell communication. And there's a loss of um, inhibition or inhibitory control within the brain cells. And so, um, therefore, this is thought to arise in a consolidation of abnormal motor program, which then leads to dystonia. But so far, it's not certain uh, why abnormal brain plasticity occurs and how it occurs. And we know that um, there are abnormal communication between parts of the brain that receive signals from the body and uh, to the parts of the brain that's responsible for motor programming. Uh, for example, researchers have found um, people with dystonia have difficulty dis uh, discriminating two pinprick feelings if they're placed very close to each other compared to normal people. Uh, or if those two pinprick feelings are separated closely in time compared to normal people. 
uh, and so far with imaging studies, um, we've discovered in people with dystonia there are abnormality in the function of the basal ganglia section of the brain and as well as the cerebellum which is the back of the brain and um, again the parts of the brain that receive signals from the body and executes action within the body and he also found there is reduction in the connectivity between uh, the cerebellum to the um, part of the brain as well as abnormal body part representation and processing within the brain. And so far, um, people who carry a certain genetic forms of dystonia have these changes in their imaging study. Um, and it's interesting that even people who carry the gene but do not have dystonia also um, have these changes on the imaging study. So the question is now whether there's other environmental influences or other genetic factors that might be at play uh, that cause um, people to uh, have symptoms of dystonia. So that's just a um, picture of, for example, a functional MRI just displaying um, on the left-hand side normal um, finger representation in normal people. So the uh, yellow dot is the thumb and the red square represents a little finger. So you can see the um, representation of the thumb and the little finger in the normal person on the left hand side is quite separated whereas people with hand dystonia um, they're quite, they merge quite close together and almost uh, overlapping. So this is what we mean by abnormal body part representation in the brain. Uh, and thirdly, ways of studying dystonia is by measuring brain chemicals. So we know um, dystonia can happen uh, when there's abnormal dopamine signal pathway and dopamine is a type of um, neurotransmitter or chemical in the brain that allows the brain cells to talk to each other. So um, we know when there is uh, a decrease in the production of dopamine in genetically inherited condition called doper-responsive dystonia that people um, can manifest with dystonia because of dopamine deficiency. And once this is replaced, their dystonia completely resolves. Uh, and secondly, uh, there are medications that block dopamine receptors within the brain that can also give rise to dystonia if given long term. And thirdly, um, in some people with very early Parkinson's disease, they can actually have foot dystonia, um, probably as part of dopamine deficiency. And when this is treated with levodopa, uh, it tends to uh, resolve. So we also know from um, the new mutations that we discovered genetic forms of dystonia, um, there are calcium and chloride um, ion channel mutations that have been linked to uh, neck dystonia and writer's cramp. And so somehow um, calcium and chloride uh, channels can change the cell potential and how cells uh, talk to each other within the brain. And thirdly, we know certain types of mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondria is a type of um, energy powerhouse within the brain cell and so when there's lack of energy or battery to the brain cell, it also disrupts the way um, that the brain cells can talk to, to each other and certain types of mitochondrial condition can also manifest uh, with dystonia symptoms. Uh, and fourthly, uh, in brain studies looking at inhibitory brain chemical called GABA, um, in dystonia subjects they found there is a reduction in this inhibitory brain chemical. So we know for sure there are changes in the uh, chemical within the brain in dystonia subjects. And uh, what happens um, after, uh, during the autopsy in brain dystonia patients. So in patients they have discovered uh, damages to certain structures can give rise to dystonia. For example, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, um, part of the brain called the parietal 
cortex and the cerebellum and top part of the spinal cord. But not all dystonias uh, we need to bear in mind are due to damage to the structures I just mentioned. And um, there are really no um, consistent damage uh, within the brain in idiopathic forms of dystonia. And in those people who just have dystonic tremor, um, people have actually found uh, reduced brain cell density within the cerebellum. Uh, and so how do we investigate and manage uh, dystonia? So in the way that we, uh, I just mentioned how we classify dystonia, then we work out a um, targeted way for investigation. Uh, and usually it's by a neurologist who's trained in subspecialty of neurology called movement disorders. So I'm just going to talk briefly about um, the management of various forms of dystonia. And the first one is about childhood dystonia. And as I mentioned, we try to look for the underlying cause because treatment of this uh, can uh, is actually the, the treatment for the dystonia. Uh, otherwise, usually we give a levodopa trial to see if patient has levodopa responsive dystonia and usually the response within a few days quite dramatic with the low dose of levodopa. Uh, thirdly, if we if levodopa doesn't help, then we try anticholinergic medication called Artang or try hexyphenidol. And um, various doses depend on how generalized or focal the dystonia is. Um, but usually um, in generalized dystonia for children, they need quite large doses and they, they can tolerate quite large doses. And with the addition of orobaclofen, um, children with generalized dystonia has been shown to uh, have benefits in terms of walking um, and function. And um, there is also a consideration for botulinum toxin therapy um, or if uh, for additional therapy uh, to the medications I just mentioned or uh, as main therapy if the child has vocal dystonia. And finally, if medication and botulinum and toxin injection uh, doesn't seem to help, then um, we will consider uh, DBS for generalized form of um, childhood dystonia. So DBS is deep brain stimulation, and usually the target is um, deep in the brain in a region called globus pallidus interna, which is a part of the basal ganglia. Uh, so, in terms of response to deep brain stimulation, um, it depends on the genetic mutation of the patient. Um, they tend to say those with DYT1 uh, tend to do a lot better than the other genetic forms of dystonia. And so far for the DYT1 patients, we have seven years of data uh, who has shown sustained improvement in more than 200 patients. And improvement is quite significant. About 60% of people improve in the uh, clinical dystonia rating scale and the disability score, which is what we use to assess their um, dystonia severity and their function. And about 60% of children then later um, didn't need to continue taking medication for dystonia. And around about 90% on average had medication reduction. Uh, it's known that if the DBS or deep brain stimulation is done early, that can be quite useful because, um, as I mentioned before, um, when contractures develop, um, they're irreversible. Uh, and so the aim is to try to uh, do the DBS early to avoid uh, contractions from forming because once it's formed, um, there's markedly less improvement with deep brain stimulation. However, um, people still need to bear in mind before going for neurosurgery to think about the risk involved. And it's not only the neurosurgical risk, it's also the um, maintenance of the deep brain stimulator device and its pacemaker battery. 
and so there is about 8% chance uh, of fracture of the stimulator lead and 8% chance of battery infection rate for these children. Uh, so in terms of um, DBS for uh, what they used to call secondary dystonia um, due to cerebral palsy, so you can see the average improvement is a lot less than the DYT1 form of dystonia, run about 22% of dystonia in the functional disability scale. Um, the pain has a similar amount at 12 months and it's very hard to predict the individual's response because there's a, quite a wide range between no improvement to about 60% improvement. And so all these numbers are average figures. Uh, so I'm going to move on to talk about the so characteristics and management of adult onset uh, isolated focal dystonia. So dystonia um, that we can't find the cause for and dystonia only affects of the body. And so I'm going to talk about neck dystonia, dystonia involving the eyes, a vocal cords, uh, writer's cramp, uh, dystonia in the hand that only happens with writing. And most of these uh, are what we call sporadic, which means uh, it, does, it is not inherited uh, in the family and usually they don't spread to other areas. However, around about 20% of people can um, later notice and spread to it body region only. So with neck dystonia, usually the average age of onset is around 50 and people experience involuntary neck or shoulder muscle uh, activation, uh, twisting postures or tremors that are irregular and jerky and um, this can also result in quite a lot of neck or shoulder pain. Uh, most commonly the cause is unknown, um, but there are other causes as well like Parkinson's disease or atypical Parkinsonism and occasionally medication induced. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the management of neck dystonia. Um, so the mainstay of treatment is botulinum toxin injection. Uh, type A is available in Australia and type B is uh, only available through special access scheme and available in overseas. Uh, so uh, it's both equally effective at four weeks after injection and usually the type A one lasts a lot longer, three months compared to type B which is 10 weeks and people uh, the research has found about a 25% improvement in the uh, neck dystonia rating scale, uh, but and also similarly in improvement in the disability, and interestingly, 30 to 40% great uh, improvement in the pain scale. Uh, and the type B toxin, which is only overseas, uh, had more side effects of dry mouth and trouble swallowing. Uh, so usually for neck dystonia, in general, uh, tablet medication usually don't help, but there have been some people who found some certain medications helpful, such as levodopa or clonazepam. Uh, and so far, there's a Dutch physiotherapy trial uh, whose results we're waiting for to see whether this is helpful for neck dystonia um, patients. And uh, usually if medication and botulinum toxin injections are not helpful and they still have quite severe refractory neck dystonia, uh, then we proceed to consider deep stimulation again to the um, deep part of the basal ganglia called the globus pallidus and these people then tend to have a lot greater improvement in a severity, disability and pain scale compared to the botulinum toxin injection and also improvement in their general health and depression scores. And so far there is enough um, data uh, to suggest this improvement is sustained up to eight years after the brain surgery. So moving on to blepharospasm, which is dystonia affecting the eyes. And so it causes involuntary contraction of the muscles around the eyes and it comes on gradually uh, at the average age of 50 and usually patients notice uh, eye irritation or dryness 
which then later becomes excessive leaking and um, involuntary closure uh, of the eye, which is worse um, when they're doing certain tasks or um, looking at bright light. And in some people can be as bad uh, as causing functional blindness and inability to drive. And as I mentioned before, about 20% of people can notice dystonia spreading to surrounding areas of the face, such as a vocal cord, neck or arm. So the management again is mainly with botulinum toxin injection and this time um, people notice quite a marked improvement in the majority of patients and lasts for about three to four months in its um, benefit. And um, about 10% of people uh, notice um, transient side effects such as droopiness of the eyes, low vision, um, bruising at the site of the injection and about um, some patients can benefit from a dose of clonazepam or trihexyphenidol or tetrabenazine, but that's uh, the minority of patients. So um, there has been other therapy that's described to help with lepharospasm if botulinum toxin and medications don't help. Uh, so there are surgery that can be done to uh, to partially section the eye muscles that causes the blinking uh, that some people have um, found benefit if they don't respond to the previously mentioned therapies and um, people have tried lubrication drops but it may or may not help and similarly to this rose color FL41 lens uh, that can be a little bit helpful with light sensitivity and finally um, there hasn't been a lot of patients uh, considering deep brain stimulation for blepharospasm partly because the botulinum toxin injection tend to do so well and so so far there's only nine case reports in the scientific literature but they do improve um, around about 70 to 90 percent which is quite encouraging. So I'm going to move on to talk about spasmodic dysphonia which is uh, like a laryngeal or voice box um, dystonia and again the average age of onset is around 50 and only comes on when somebody is speaking uh, and interestingly when someone whispers, reads out loud, sings or shouts uh, it does not affect them uh, and so there's different types um, of uh, spasmodic dysphonia so there's the a deductive type where the vocal cords come together when they're not supposed to and so that leads to like a strangled voice um, break in between um, the vowels whereas the AB doctor where the vocal cords come apart when they're not supposed to uh, leads to a breathy, prolonged breathy voice uh, and that happens within the consonants. So again, management is with botulinum toxin injection, uh, usually with EMG guidance to make sure that we are uh, in the muscle uh, at the time of injection. And this is a main method or therapy and patients found usually a moderate uh, improvement. Uh, usually the type that improves the most is the one that where the vocal cords come together and so, so on average, these are um, studies from I think New York, uh, they report about improvement of up to 91% of normal, so that's up to, it's not the average, um, but there are side effects of breathiness and hoarseness uh, that may not come with um, each injection and the AB doctor type where the vocal cords come apart when they talk um, patients report their voice quality uh, of improvement of 70% of normal. And just going to talk briefly about writer's cramp. So the average age of onset for these conditions is a lot younger at the age of 30 and again only comes on during writing and not when typing or doing other things with the hand and patients can complain of tightness or stiffness of the arm or forearm muscles with writing and that goes away when somebody um, stops writing and so that can lead to reduced uh, speed of writing and uh, difficulty doing cursive writing 
um, compared to printing. And similarly, hand dystonia can affect um, other occupations such as musicians, blackjack dealers and typists and um, golfers, um, and which is also known as uh, yipping golfers. And similarly, can affect the footing runners and the hand in dartsmen and trap shooters. And so um, there's a theory that maybe repetitive hand or foot use um, might be associated with development of dystonia later on. And there has been certainly um, monkey animal models demonstrating this. So just some pictures showing you what um, musicians' dystonia look like. Uh, for a pianist and violinist, a flute player and a trombone player. And again, the treatment is botulinum toxin injection for writer's cramp. Um, and as we mentioned before, side effects um, could be temporary weakness and bruising as the botulinum toxin injection usually only lasts for two and a half to three months. Uh, we use a method where we um, get them to write with the non-dominant hand to look at which muscles we should inject in the dominant hand and that's called mirror dystonia guidance. Uh, about 30% of people can report some benefit with medications that I mentioned before uh, in addition to um, uh, benzodiazepines. And with musicians dystonia um, patients, about 60% uh, improvement with occupational therapy. Um, so what they do is they temporarily immobilize the finger that is dystonic and then pay, um, the musicians undergo a period of rehab with the occupational therapist. And about 30% of improvement with trihexyphenidol. But this is difficult to use in people who um, play the brass instrument because it can cause dry mouth. Uh, and about um, 40 to 50 percent of improvement with botulinum toxin injection, particularly with the finger flexion type of dystonia. Uh, however, with usually with the um, brass player's dystonia of the mouth, they need to undergo um, uh, retraining of their embouchure rather than botulinum toxin injection or medication. So lastly, I'm going to talk about psychogenic dystonia. Uh, it's about um, one-fifth of all psychogenic movement disorders, and it's thought to be, uh, the theory behind it is thought to be a reaction or a method of coping with either current past stress or trauma. Uh, and this is not under any voluntary um, control, and so patients are not making this uh, dystonia up. And so far, it's not well understood how this would lead to, um, to increased connection between the emotional part of the brain and the brain involved in movement preparation. And this has been shown in brain, uh, functional brain scans in people with psychogenic dystonia. And similarly, it's also shown there's decreased connection between emotional part of the brain and part of the brain that plans movements. However, people with psychogenic dystonia, um, which is different from the uh, organic dystonia as I mentioned before, people with psychogenic dystonia, they have normal brain plasticity and also normal body part representation in the brain. So usually psychogenic dystonia can happen intermittently or becomes fixed at onset or sudden onset. Um, they can have previous uh, spontaneous uh, improvement and resolution of dystonia. Uh, often it can happen after just minor trauma. And the uh, body part affected by dystonia can have change in color, temperature associated with pain. And how we diagnose this uh, is through um, knowing what organic dystonia look like and finding that psychogenic dystonia really lack the typical findings of organic dystonia. However, it causes just as much as significant disability as organic dystonia. So, so far this condition is quite underdiagnosed and undertreated uh, because it's under-recognized. 
Um, and it's a difficult diagnosis to make because the neurologist themselves has to be quite familiar with organic dystonia, um, which is quite rare as we saw the figures of um, commonness in the previous slide. And in addition, um, there is also a lack of acceptance of diagnosis often in both the doctor and the patient. And so this can be misdiagnosed um, as other con organic conditions and can lead to unnecessary surgery um, or medication trials. And it's unfortunate because this condition is potentially curable with inpatient rehabilitation plus or minus psychotherapy and psychiatric support. And so early treatment of this condition can lead to increased chance of recovery. And um, usually the treatment involves intense motor re uh, reprogramming with the physiotherapist and rehab center uh, that specializes in this. And studies have shown there's about 50 to 60 percent of patients who have marked improvement or resolution um, that is sustained uh, at the follow-up period at two years. But just got to bear in mind, not all centers uh, are trained in motor reprogramming uh, or psychogenic movement disorders. So you have to find a center that um, is willing and recognizes uh, this condition. So I'm going to talk briefly about research studies on dystonia that um, uh, that I have contacts with so far. And so leading up from the psychogenic dystonia, um, there is research from the psychiatry department within our hospital uh, looking at how those with psychogenic movement disorder and normal volunteers manage stress. And um, they also compare the methods of treatment uh, where they give um, um, psychotherapy plus or minus the traditional physiotherapy uh, treatment route and, and the criteria is that they need to be diagnosed by somebody in Westmere Neurology with a psychogenic movement disorder uh, and is an adult between the age of 18 and 65 who can read and speak English and have enough vision and hand dexterity to use a mouse and a keyboard and perform some web-based memory tasks. So if you're interested in this, uh, you probably should let me know and I can give you the contact details. Um, so the next one is, which I'm helping out with, is called the Estonia Coalition Project. And this is like an international observation study all across the world. And we aim to try and recruit 5,000 people worldwide and to get um, a database of DNA uh, medical history, demographic, demographic medications and physical exam findings. And we're recruiting people who have idiopathic isolated dystonia and we follow them up every one to four years with questionnaires about things like depression, um, social phobia and anxiety as well as um, physical exam findings and just um, their medical history again. And so far, um, the Dystonia Coalition has made quite a lot of discoveries in um, discovering new genes for neck dystonia, for example. So if you're interested, um, you can head to this website to have a look at the publications um, they put out so far. So I'll give you a few seconds to write that down. And. I'm nearly finished, so we should have about 15 minutes for questions later on. And if you haven't got this one, um, I think later on they're recording this session, so you should be able to get this web address later on. So um, the last research project is part of my PhD in movement and posture control in dystonia patients. So I'm trying to recruit people with writer's cramp or neck dystonia and our theory is that dystonia is a difficulty or problem in posture control pathway of the brain because so far um, in monkey or animal studies they found there's a separate movement control and postural control pathway within the brain. So we're going to do um, surface measurement of um, 
muscle activity potentials, which is uh, lasting one hour when somebody pushes against their wrist against the lever while sitting down. And um, we're going to measure their brain excitability using um, magnetic stimulation methods, which last for one and a half hours. And uh, at the Brain and Mind Institute, hopefully we're going to start doing functional brain MRIs on people with writer's cramp and comparing it with um, normal control studies, uh, normal control subjects. Uh, so as I think Gerald mentioned before, the internet um, is not a reliable source of information. You really have to pick and choose uh, where you should get your source of information from. Uh, so these are all the, I think, the reliable um, sources of information to get um, more information about dystonia. So maybe I'll move on to questions now. So looking at all the questions so far that's been posted. Jane was asking, should all dystonia patients have a MRI? Yes, I think so. Um, they should at least have a brain and a cervical spine MRI to make sure there are no structural abnormalities within the upper spinal cord or the brain causing dystonia. Because that will... Um, it, it probably wouldn't affect your management, but then um, it, it would uh, sort of give you an idea what's causing it. And also, um, if it's due to previous... Uh, childhood stroke, for example, then um, possible ways of avoiding avoiding the cause, causing further damage later on. Yeah. So then Lucy wanted to ask, is there anything known about how DBS helps to revert symptoms? So that's a very good question um, because it's interesting how DVS reverts symptoms uh, in a different speed within different types of dystonia. So the ones that are drug-induced, the DVS, pretty much reverts the symptoms within, um, within 24 hours, which is very different from the genetic forms of dystonia, like the DYT ones I talked about. So the DVS tends to improve the symptoms over a longer period, for example, three to nine months. Um, and then even slower in other types of genetic forms of dystonia. So there must be um, different underlying sort of mechanisms that causes dystonia in these three different groups. And so, so far we don't know exactly how DBS can uh, revert dystonia, but we know um, it somehow restores the brain plasticity but we don't know how because it's such a complex thing. Yeah. So that's why it's a good question because no one knows. <laughs> and then Brian wanted to ask, are we sure that the basal ganglia is a correct place for DBS as a target? Uh, so I think for the genetic forms of dystonia and childhood dystonia I mentioned before, um, it seems that they seem to have a very good response to deep brain stimulation and they have long-term data showing sustained response. So I think it is um, the right target. Uh, and however, I think there are researchers also looking at different targets for um, dystonia. Uh, so so uh, um, I haven't heard of any other targets that's been shown to be better than the globus pallidus, which is the part of the basal ganglia that we were just talking about. And then how, second question from Brian is how do you feel about the non-invasive technique of magnetic impulses outside the head being used to treat cervical dystonia? So, yeah, this is um, like a, theoretically it's a, um, research project to see if there's non-invasive ways to change the brain excitability through repetitive magnetic impulses. So um, I think so far it's still uh, a working progress. 
so researchers are still testing to see if that helps people. Um, so it's not mainstream therapy yet because it's still under research. Um, and then I'm just looking at the next question from Brian. What is the life expectancy of a rechargeable electronic neurostimulator? So for dystonia, it really depends. Um, if somebody depends on the setting, uh, if somebody is on uh, a higher setting for um, generalized dystonia, for example, uh, then Usually the battery can last only like two to three years, but there are ways of changing the setting around so the battery can last for about four to five years. Uh, there's batteries called rechargeable batteries available, uh, which then uh, you can recharge every like twice or three times a week, uh, and then so you wouldn't have to worry about battery depletion that way. Um, Try and see what I'm up to. Okay, so question from Ian. First question from Ian. Why is Australia so behind in its acceptance of this diagnosis when it is medically accepted in Canada, US, uh, Europe, and the UK? So that's a good question. I think um, probably because of lack of public awareness, um, but hopefully with more support groups for dystonia coming up. Uh, we should be able to raise more public awareness for dystonia. And secondly, I think also with the lack of electronic medical record system, um, that's probably why we still don't know the exact um, frequency and how common dystonia is in Australia. Whereas I think in centres like the US, it's got a pretty uh, long history of the electronic medical record system up to uh, 15 years. So I'm going to go through the second question from Ian. So with only 3% of people with dystonia worldwide, why does a psychogenic diagnosis appear to prevail more and more in these cases? Mm. I'm not sure what, okay, psychogenic. I'm not sure what you mean by that question. 3% of people with dystonia worldwide. Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by that question. Maybe you could to rephrase it and so I can try and answer it again, Ian. Um, so I'll move on to your third question. So psychogenic suggests it's a conversion from psychological to physical symptom, even if there is no previous history. How can this be a valid diagnosis? So um, even if there's no previous history of psychological stress or trauma is what I assume you're talking about. Uh, so it's a valid diagnosis if um, the clinical formal dystonia doesn't really fit into um, what we observe from organic types of dystonia and um, it's really like a diagnosis um, made by like a neurologist who is uh, has seen a lot of forms of um, organic dystonia and um, we know that from treatment of people with psychogenic dystonia, about 50 to 60 percent of them go back to completely normal after reprogramming or physio rehab therapy. And so I guess in that point uh, you could argue, uh, unlike most forms of organic dystonia which is uh, not reversible with physiotherapy, uh, the psychogenic forms can. And so People often argue what the mind can um, do onto the body, the mind can also undo, and plus there is no abnormal brain plasticity there, so there is a potential for uh, improvement and recovery. So, okay, lots and lots of questions. So next question is from Kim. 
So Kim says, um, I have cervical dystonia as does my sister and my daughter. And cervical dystonia was spoken about as a later onset condition rather than childhood. And how many cases have been found where it appears to be um, hereditary from birth. So yes, childhood neck dystonia is relatively less common than those who come on during adulthood. And if there's a positive family history that um, you were mentioning, Kim. So it's probably not the idiopathic or um, type of dystonia where we don't know the cause. So it could be uh, had to consider a hereditary form of dystonia. And I don't know how many cases or why this is being um, described, but it's certainly less common than the adult form of dystonia. Um, you can. I don't think there are. I think uh, I don't think there are exact numbers um, detailing how many cases uh, there are in people who have neck dystonia from birth. Okay. Still going through a list of questions. So next one is from Grant. His, uh, Grant says. I received a mild traumatic brain injury five years ago. About eight months later, I started to get symptoms of blepharospasm. I was then diagnosed with MAGE syndrome. My question is, are there any studies of proof that dystonia can be attributed to head injury? So, uh, so I think so far there has been some studies alluding to that dystonia can come on after um, stress. Uh, psychological stress or even some minor trauma, but so can things like psychogenic dystonia. So I think um, we still have to be sure um, undergo like a neurological um, consultation. Um, I don't know the exact condition behind and the circumstances behind the minor head trauma. So. I can't, I'm afraid I can't really answer that question because it's a clinical judgment question. So I can't answer that online. Sorry. Okay, lots of questions. <laughs> I got two minutes, so I'm afraid I can't answer all these questions. But I'll do my best. Uh, where can I? So Paul is asking, where can I go to see a neurologist in Australia, New South Wales? that is familiar with dystonia. So um, besides Westmead, I think there are also centres in St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney that have neurologists familiar with dystonia. Uh, and also um, I think Concord Hospital, uh, there is also a movement disorder specialist there. And uh, I think those are, yeah, I think those are the main centres that can that I can think of. Oh, and of course, um, there's also Royal North Shore Hospital as well. So the next question is, is it common to have both a B doctor and a D doctor spasmodic dystonia? And the question is from David. So um, it is it is also possible, I think it's around um, 20 to 30% of people with spasmodic dysphonia who has both forms of it. Uh, so it's not that common, but it's about 20 to 30 percent. Okay, Angela asked, does Botox affect bone density if used long term for neck dystonia? Hmm. So I'm not aware of Botox causing osteopenia or osteoporosis for long term use. Um, it might be a good research question to do, because I don't think I'm not aware of any studies that suggest that. Okay. So next one, Margot is asking about um, the postural control research that I'm involved in. And so she's asking, does this mean the vestibular system may be involved uh, if it is proven to involve postural control? And what does this mean for treatment as well as the understanding of the causes? So yes, I think for neck dystonia there has been um, 
uh, alluded to that the vestibular system um, might be involved as well. And certainly the, um, the eyes is quite closely linked to the vestibular system. And also with the um, dystonia can be affected by various positioning of the body, such as lying down versus sitting up and standing. Uh, so certainly I think the vestibular system um, probably contributes a little um, to dystonia and probably um, ad adapts and adjusts to the changes, uh, whatever changes that causes dystonia. So, yeah, I think unless um, we understand what's causing the postural control difficulties in, um, in dystonia, then we wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to comment on um, what it means for treatment and, uh, yeah, so unless we understand it, we won't be able to understand how to treat it. Uh, so the next one is, my son is eight, and I think this will be the last question from Kylie. My son is eight and has paroxysmal dystonia. I find he's worse in winter. Uh, do you think the cold makes the patient worse? So certainly, I know um, during the cold, some people might get um, more psychological or physically stressed, and people with dystonia have certainly noticed that stress can make the dystonia temporarily worse, so I, I do that. Uh, I do think it's certainly possible. Um, okay. So, unfortunately, I can't answer all the questions today. Um, so, thanks very much for everyone who's participated, and thanks for Gerald and the Brain Foundation for inviting me to talk about this my favourite topic. <laughs> Florence, Florence, do you hear that? Yes. I, I think I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Florence, well, thank you very, 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 very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, whilst I'm involved with all the neurological disorders, I don't know of them all that much, but I certainly was astounded to find how widespread and the varied types of dystonia affects people. I thought it was a very small subset of Parkinson's, but apparently, obviously, I can't expect too much. I might say that we could give you a little extension of time if you're if you're not committed, because there's only a few more questions to go. Okay. Uh, people, if you don't mind answering them, uh, we have a last we have written a, a line under the last one, and that's from. Uh, I'll just go to this now. Um, the last question was from. Um, here we are. Kylie at 7.57, so she did get in over the line, if you like to think of that, in terms of uh, the timing of submitting a question. Mm. But I was, I was surprised to find that, that this activity, occupational one, I always thought the piano players suffered arthritis rather than dystonia. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they have both or either, either or or both, do you think? For the head's not going too well. Is that always dystonia or is it sometimes? Um... Uh, it's not always dystonia. Yeah, so some people can have overuse and pain associated with it, whereas the um, musician dystonia, they uh, tend to be relatively painless and the dystonia yeah. comes on pretty much at the very beginning of playing rather than uh, later on during a uh, longer and longer practice. Yeah. I understand. Well, they do have to practice the professional ones. They play a lot and a lot. But the other thing is that if I may go back, maybe I'm going too far back in time with repetitive strain injury. Is that a form of dystonia or was that no. a psycho? No, that's um, that's what I mean by overuse. So there is a lot more pain compared to uh, uh, dystonia, and also the repetitive strain injury tends to happen um, like as people. Uh, later on as they do the task repetitively rather than dystonia which happens pretty much immediately upon playing yeah, or yes. upon doing um, the task that their hand repetitively does. But I think in older literatures like in the 80s people didn't know about dystonia so they often called it repetitive strain injury. <laughs> and so well, back I, in I, 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 things get yes, a yes, yes, yeah, I think <laughs> that the last one was uh, Kylie, her son, 
Now there is one from Anna. Yeah. TMS safe and so on. If we wouldn't mind just dealing with those, if you can, real quickly, to give people who kindly uh, heard us out and that we did say they could have questions up to eight o'clock. Thank you. Oh, okay, sure. So yeah, TMS is fairly. It's quite safe. It's been used, uh, I think, since the eighties uh, for research purposes. And I think overseas now, um, it's been used for even treatment for things like depression. Uh, and various psychiatric conditions. Um, so there's possible side effects. So some people get a discomfort over the scalp where the stimulation occurs. Um, and in some people, um, it causes a mild headache, but it shouldn't cause um, uh, anything more severe than that. Certainly people who have a seizure disorder probably shouldn't uh, Probably should be careful before they undergo TMS study. But I know my colleague has um, been using TMS to study patients with seizures. So even I think that's been shown to be relatively safe. Sorry, just silence my phone. Um, so I'm going to go down from Anna's question um, down further. So David's asking, do you know much about usage of POMS uh, in terms of neuromodulation stimulator in the help uh, of dystonia apart from invasive deep brain stimulation? So I haven't heard of that one, so I don't know very much about it, sorry. Yeah, it could still be in the experimental research phase, I think. Um, and generally you can tell um, which one, which treatment is actually being scientifically proven by going on to websites such as Google Scholar and looking it up there and making sure it's from like a reputable scientific journal. But it's just a lot faster to probably ask a health professional. So the question after that is after Anna. After David, okay. So um, Mary is asking uh, about DRD genetic mutation uh, and taking liver dopa very successfully, very grateful. So I'd like to know about liver dopa being a treatment for depression and anxiety, which in ways was worse than dystonia. Yeah, um, and she. Apparently, the liver dopa also helps with dystonia and anxiety. Yes. So, yeah, certainly dopamine is not only a uh, neurotransmitter for the motor system, it also uh, is a, also a neurotransmitter for part of the limbic system, which is the emotional aspect of the brain. Uh, and certainly in patients such as Parkinson patients uh, who suffer quite a lot from anxiety, depression, as well as slowness and stiffness, um, taking the levodopa actually helps with both anxiety and depression, uh, as well as their motor symptoms. So, yeah, I definitely agree that the levodopa can help with depression and anxiety. But, yeah, depending on the condition. Um, because if there's a dopamine deficiency, um, treating that condition with um, liver dopa is the way to try and um, fix it. So not all people with depression and anxiety uh, should be treated with liver dopa. Depends on the cause. So next one is Kate is asking, do you know if the trigeminal nerve affects uh, dystonia? Mm. No, I don't think so because um, with dystonia it's classified as a central nervous system condition. So uh, we think it's an abnormality arising from the brain or the upper part of the spinal cord. So I don't think trigeminal nerve affects dystonia unless somebody gets trigeminal nerve pain, which can cause stress and that can indirectly worsen dystonia. And then so Joanna is asking, I'm 32 year old with dopa responsive dystonia um, based on levodopa 
plants like a miracle cure for me, but get return of symptoms with physical illness and stress, and do stress and uh, illness um, can normally do this. Uh, so, yeah, definitely stress can cause um, return of symptoms and physical illness in people. So it's also important to address um, psychological needs as well, uh, as stress, as we mentioned several times, can worsen symptoms of dystonia. Uh, moving on to next question. So is it possible for... Huh? Sorry, Gerald. Well, Kylie, yes, Kylie, that's the one. That, that, that way we've yeah. hit the uh, finishing line for Kylie. Thank you. Uh, is it possible for paroxysmal dystonia to go into remission? Uh, so, I think when it, with some forms of paroxysmal dystonia under treatment, they can go into remission. Um, if it's due to psychogenic dystonia, that can also go into remission. So, it's definitely possible. So, yes. Oh, okay. That was the last question. Well, thanks everyone for all the excellent questions. Well, thank you very much indeed for please, uh, kindly extending your time. We know how much pressure uh, you work under on a time basis, Florence. And thank you for those people who stayed with us for the uh, presentation. And if you found that very useful, please let us know on the website and tell others you may know about how we're striving to help you as much as we can. And of course, the missing link always in many areas of medicine is the funds are the funds for research and so raising the money is the next step towards getting a solution to the problem and thank you all very much and good night